Center, CUNY, the City University um, of uh, New York at the Graduate Center. It's uh, another day on planet Earth, another day in New York City, and um, we are continuing our journey um, around the world. Yesterday, uh, we were in Kenya and we're listening to three uh, great uh, uh, theater workers um, who told us about the new developments, how it is, how they experienced the time of Corona actually quite well, very low, very low cases. And they feel that their government is handling it so much better than the US and they are right. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, so today we uh, move on to a country that seems so far away from New York and America, yet it is so close, it's Canada. And uh, we at the Seagulls and had many exchanges with playwrights, uh, writers, with the Quebecois delegation, Emmanuel Siwa, who helped us uh, to, to, to connect uh, uh, to this Jean-Pierre and, uh, and, and, and everyone in, um, in, uh, in New York, Taylor Gaines, who's now there. But uh, people in New York uh, do not know so much about Canada. They know more about uh, uh, Perhaps uh, you were Britain and in France, in Paris, they know more about Canadian playwrights and artists or in Berlin than we in New York do. So it's something very strange. There seems to be a time wall, an invisible wall between those two countries. And um, as Michael Moore in his great documentaries also showed when it came to gun violence and others, this is just an invisible markation on the ground. But things work differently. There are different forms of government, different forms of engagement, different forms of health care, different forms of art support. And it does show how radically different it is and that the forms we live by um, are of significance. Um, today, uh, it's uh, 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 again a, a day of uh, incredibly high cases in the US. It's a big spike, 85 to 90%. Um, it is uh, going up. It's a devastating situation for uh, testing. Meanwhile, almost all the industrial nations in the world have testing available in the US, a long, long line. Some people have to wait for two weeks. I want this morning to have, if I want to get a test, how long would it be the earliest I was offered is the 17th um, of July. So something is going uh, terribly wrong. Uh, numbers in India, Russia, Brazil, UK are going up. UK is terribly hit. Uh, and they're doing something really wrong there. They don't seem to be able to, to, to manage it um, in a good way. Uh, Bolsonaro, the Brazilian president who so recklessly ignored this crisis now has been tested positive today, just mm -hmm. uh, came out and, um, uh, and it, Brazil started late, but already I think they have over 35,000 dead people. It's uh, one of the countries that's uh, really, um, really in danger. The uh, US government uh, put 1.6 billion dollars into a vaccination Novavax. People think it might work, but it's not really clear. And uh, of course, we all hope that by the end of the year, there is a, a vaccination. Australia is again in lockdown in Melbourne. Um, Israel is thinking about a, a lockdown again, as in Switzerland. Uh, depression in healthcare workers has been detected. They are not doing well. It's way too long a time. Uh, uh, around the globe, it's uh, devastating numbers of people infected, but also the daily onslaught and no end inside um, is putting a big uh, strain uh, on everyone. International students in the US are endangered. Uh, it looks like they all will have to leave the US. Even if they're already here, they will not get a visa to stay here. They say if online courses are available, why would you be in our country? It's shocking, it's wrong. It's uh, against that idea that studying so is being part in a different country is of a significance. So um, we hope um, that this will not be the case, but um, it is, uh, it is quite, uh, quite shocking uh, what, what we are uh, going through. The UK gave $2 billion towards the arts with all they are doing wrong for the vaccinations and keeping the people safe. They put $2 billion towards museums, theater companies and, uh, and uh, uh, places that create cultural events uh, in the US. We don't see that New York City actually lost 1 million jobs. New York City alone um, in this crisis, it's devastating. It will take many, many years to get back to New York City if it what it was, if it ever will. And um, we do believe in this city, it's a great city and things will change, but it is a devastating moment and still no indoor dining and uh, it is uh, complicated. Uh, animals are dying. There are less slaughter. Slaughterhouses uh, all across Europe and in the US uh, are being um, monitored. And uh, so there are transports 
have more animals in them in the farms they can get out so there is a really and not just in the human world also in the animal world with many infections for 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 those uh, poor creatures uh, so it is uh, showing what everything was wrong already uh, again it shows uh, that forms are not working we need new initiatives new ideas and we have to reinvent everything it's like in the creational myth as spider women told us we are in a new creational myth there's a mad king uh, there is a plague in the country and things are not working and we have to uh, find different different ways um, there are also studies now coming out in Europe that say not only coughing and being close is dangerous, the heavy particles actually fall quite fast onto the earth, but in rooms, in air, uh, particles might stay much, much longer. It has to be studied. Uh, the World Health, Health Organization is not fully accepting that as a possible uh, means of transmitting uh, the virus, but it looks like uh, it is uh, much more dangerous than we thought. And if there will be any mutations, which normally happens, we all do not know. What will be Tesla together with the German company is producing uh, little units that will print RNA testing once something is available. They hope they uh, can co can uh, uh, find something to produce vaccinations independently and fast, which is a great idea. So things are out there. Never the medical and scientific community has collaborated so closely together. Over a hundred vaccinations are out there, and if there's a one percent chance that one of them works, it should be something in here. So um, after our talks again, uh, which went from Africa, Japan, Hong Kong, which is a very, very complicated situation after also the talk with our uh, colleagues uh, in Hong Kong, where China now is uh, fully implementing a law that is disrespectful of signed agreements. And, uh, and uh, for theater artists, it will be complicated to, to uh, do and continue to do the work they have been doing. We now go to Canada, and I apologize for my long introduction, but we think we are recording the presence at the moment. We learned that we didn't think about this when these talks starts, but this is an archiving of the presence of the moment. And no other profession most probably will have such a large uh, documentation of um, what happened uh, in the time of Corona in the performing arts world and today we really needed to hear from Canada. So with us are two uh, brilliant uh, representatives of, uh, um, of uh, uh, Canada and this theater. So with us is the great Emily Monet. Emily, hello there. She is okay. an, working at the intersection of theater and performance and media arts and her artistic practice favors collaborative processes of creation and is typically presented in interdisciplinary theater and immersive performance experience. She's the artistic director of the Onishka Productions and is the artist in resident at the Centre du Théâtre d'Aujourd'hui in Montreal. She founded uh, four years ago uh, CICS, the Indigenous Contemporary Scene, a nomadic platform for the presentation of live arts by and creative exchanges for indigenous artists, and they went to Edinburgh already with it. She is a Algonquin uh, Anishinaabe and French, and she grew up in Ottawa, Quebec, and now lives in uh, Montreal. Moni Young, if I say it uh, right, uh, with us also, and she suggested that uh, is Greg Hill, a very good friend of hers, the, the National Gallery of Canada's uh, inaugural Odin Chair and Senior Curator of Indigenous Art. He is an artist and uh, part of the Mohawk uh, Kenyan uh, Kihaka, a member of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. He has built an impressive collection of contemporary indigenous art at the gallery and is a senior uh, curator there. And he, uh, of course, is a curating series uh, there for that great, great space. So both of you, um, thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. Now it's time to listen to you. Where are you exactly? And normally I say, what time is it? But I guess it's the same time as New York. So, uh, Emily, where are you now? Well, I'm, uh, I'm in the Utawe. I'm in a, in a town near Ottawa called uh, Chelsea. So it's right in the Gatineau Park. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's surrounded by, by lakes and there's a, a river and, uh, and trees. And it's also the place around here that I grew up. So it's actually quite special to be back. because I really feel like I'm taking care of my roots. And so, so that, that's quite nice. When did you move there? When did you go there? 
Uh, well, I, I, I was born in Ottawa, so I grew up in that area of um, a lot of my childhood and uh, teenage years. But now I, I live and work in Montreal, but because of the pandemic and the confinement, then I left the city because that's really where the hot spot is in Canada. It's Montreal is the really hot spot of Canada. So it just made more sense to just leave the city and uh, be in nature and uh, really seize that that uh, that opportunity to make big changes in my life in that way. So part of it was moving, moving, moving out of the city. Yeah. Since early March or? Since only March, yes. Yes, yes. And because also everything has stopped, right? In theaters, so all the tours and the rehearsals and the, the shows have been canceled, so everything has opened up. So it just made more sense to mm -hmm. come and uh, reground myself and resource myself because it was really, um, it was really a mirror on uh, the pace of life that we have. You know, in the industry, it's an industry too, right? Theater, because we do get caught in that machine of uh, having to present work, having to. Uh, some uh, write grants and then uh, making sure that we have activities planned for you know through the year and and so on so it's been everything stopped and it was uh, uh, you know as uh, uncertain as it was at times and stressful it was also um, an opportunity I think to cease to really reflect on uh, my practice and on being more um, stable and present in the moment so yeah that's that's what right now where were you when when you basically had to make up your mind uh, what were you doing well i was in uh sydney australia with greg we were actually at the sydney biennale art biennale and uh we had to change our flights right away it was uh, they were thinking of closing the borders. And I remember we were like, oh, should we change our tickets? And then they actually, um, I think they closed the borders like four or five days after. So we really, we, we really had to change our tickets. And then we had to be in quarantine and got tested too. Um, and then since then, you know, I think people are getting more uh, used to the fact that um, this is the way we live now so people are slacking off a bit in terms of restrictions but it's still important to stay as uh, confined as possible. So you were yeah. theater, theater play in uh, Sydney on exhibition or uh, what What was your... I was, uh, well I was uh, accompanying Greg I mean Greg maybe you can talk more about uh, about the Biennale yeah. but uh, it, it was the first time there was an indigenous curator for the Biennale so that was uh, there was a very big uh, representation of indigenous uh, artists at the Biennale all from all over the globe so um, yeah and there was a big conference that was starting but they had to cancel everything was being canceled so we had to we had to we had to cancel everything too and then when i was coming back i was supposed to go to guyana french guyana to go on tour uh, for um, a, a play that i wrote called okinum and we we had to cancel too like everybody mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it came to 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 a full stop so um uh, so greg you rather go Go to Sydney, or, uh, or is it closer than being in New York City? And what is what is uh, what is your relation and to um, to um, to New York and the scene here? And um, and tell us a bit what you did in Sydney. Well, um, I, I'll, I'll get to that first. I'm going to answer your first question, like where am I? Because uh, <laughs> because I'm in the same house as Emily, right? So uh -huh. just to like the backtrack a little bit, where we're, we're in a relationship that's why we were in Sydney at the same time um, and we're actually uh, in the same place now as Emily was explaining you know partially due to COVID and the 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 really the risk of being in, in a big city like Montreal which is much like New York mm -hmm. in that sense um, here 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 in Chelsea which is just a little bit north of of Ottawa, there's not much 
COVID positive in this region. Um, so that's a good thing. And as Emily was saying, there's a, you can really see that people are relaxing here and, and kind of going back as restrictions ease to life uh, as normal in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, things were very different for us, uh, you know, when, when we were in Sydney and what was it you were, you were, you segue to Sydney, what was it specifically you wanted to know? But no, the, the idea that uh, perhaps uh, we, in New York, if you'll be, it's yes. close um, as it should be and the indigenous are, so is it, uh, um, you feel closer to to, to, to the scene in Sydney or in, uh, in Europe than to, to, to New York? Well, uh, well, I mean, as a Mohawk, uh, we're, we're a person of, of Mohawk ancestry, I feel pretty close to New York, New York State. Those are our traditional territories. Mm -hmm. um, so in New York, uh, there's a lot of indigenous people in New York. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been to New York many times for artwork to go to exhibitions, um, to see artwork, to visit collections, to, to visit artists. Um, and most recently we were there for Kent Lukman's uh, unveiling at the Met. Mm -hmm. um, so those two commission paintings that I believe, yeah, they should, they should still be there installed in the lobby at the Met, uh, which was a fantastic moment, you know, for the Met to to uh, recognize Indigenous art in that way. And they're kind of opening up now to Indigenous artists and Black artists and being, being more representative. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, yeah, New York is, uh, as an art center, has always been important. Um, and in the Indigenous art world, it's, it's important as well. Many, many artists, Indigenous artists from all over congregate in New York, just like non-Indigenous artists because of access to, there's more access there, there's more working spaces, there's community. And, uh, and we have all different kinds of communities. So New York is an important one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. That's like, good to know that in that level, it's a great exchange. How is the situation for, for Indigenous artists in Canada? When we spoke to Spider Women, Marielle and Gloria, their son-in-law died, a company member died, friends died. They said we are very, very much infected, very much inflicted by the, this, uh, and of course infected too by uh, this situation. How is it in, in, in Canada? Well, um, I think a lot of uh, regions are still not too exposed to the virus, regions where um, a lot of Indigenous communities are, but um, of, they're more vulnerable too. So it's very important to protect uh, and make sure that the, the virus does not travel to, uh, to these regions because uh, then it can be very, um, very, more than problematic, it's going to be a catastrophe because the health system is not the same as uh, in the city. So to have access to to uh, respirators and to medicine will be uh, very hard or impossible in some cases. And there's a lot of uh, people or elders, elders too. So it jeopardizes the the the, the life of our elders too. So it's it's very important to stay. Um, to make sure that we still confine and we respect these uh, these uh, regulations that the government has uh, put into place, because uh, it's our responsibility to make sure that uh, we don't jeopardize the life of our our elders. That's what I think about a lot personally. Hmm. There's, I mean, there's a. Early on, with the uh, with the onset of COVID, um, I think when you think back in uh, in indigenous communities and history and epidemics of smallpox that wiped out ninety percent of populations in some some areas of the country in Canada and the West Coast, two waves of smallpox, what thirty years apart, I think, that just devastated communities 
and and this trauma this this history is still very much alive in 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 us in our friends um so there's so the fear of covid going to commute to those communities that uh were you know were devastated that long ago is still is still alive and there's and it's a uh, it's a uh, it kind of it adds to it in that sense but also as emily was saying like the 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 real importance to protect and to shelter elders who are the uh, are keepers of, of language of of tradition of customs so we uh yeah it's 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 interesting um to experience it in that way and to think about from indigenous perspectives how that translates to uh uh, in how it's redefining what we think of as curating the what a curator does uh, traditionally the, a curator cares for objects and now our role is kind of shifting more to caring for artists uh, especially for for contemporary curators you always know, an important part of your job is your relationship with the artist um but uh but this is becoming more important and and even care for each other um within our institution the like i work at the national gallery of canada it's a national level institution so in essence it has a national scope but uh with covid and, and the kind of insular uh environments we're all having to create around ourselves there's been a lot of internal um, reconfiguring or internal reckoning, you could say too. Uh, and, uh, and it's just, the whole world has changed um, just in terms of how we exist in the world. And I think uh, like the, the very literal things of, of Emily, just in our, just in our case, Emily having to move from Montreal to here, and uh, how much that that has changed both of our lives. Um, there's yeah. so there's the there's the macro and the micro view um, in relation to what what COVID is doing. But you know the the picture you painted uh, at the outset. It's pretty dire uh, what's happening in the US, the UK, Brazil. And, uh, and we're in a pretty good situation here relatively. So, I mean, my, I, my heart was out to, to you and, uh, and dealing with that in New York. Um, even our, our personal circles, we don't know too many people that uh, that have, that came down with it. Um, I know a few, uh, but yeah, but deaths, not as much. So that's a good thing. But it, but it's, uh, but it. I don't know. I I, I guess I feel uh, blessed right right now to be in the more positive situation that we're in. But I think it's also a reality check because uh, pandemics are very uh, directly linked to the degradation of the environment and uh, the industry of uh, farming and, uh, and uh, slaughter, slaughterhouses. So, um, and it has a direct effect on me as an artist too, because I can't work. If we can't be in places where we can gather, it's, uh, it's really affecting my practice. Um, as well. So I think it's, it's, um, 
it's a reality check because there's probably going to be a second wave and it's probably just the start of, uh, of, of more um, climate change consequences, more pandemics too. We have prophecies too that, that speak of, of this too. So I can't not think about what I've heard elders say or medicine people say about... about Tell, us what, what Tell us a bit about these prophecies. Well, I don't... I don't. I mean, I'm, I don't. I don't carry the the knowledge uh, to be able to transmit it like that. But but um, I mean, it is even in in the creation stories that that we have. There was a world before this one too, and the world was destroyed and recreated. So I think it's it's still that spiral of creation and destruction and uh, of. Uh, but I'm not as worried for maybe the earth because the earth has the power to to heal and regenerate itself. It's more for us as human beings. Um, and uh, one of the prophecy that we uh, often uh, refer to is the one of the eight fire or the seven fire and then we're coming to a, a crossroad and probably we are at that crossroad and there's, uh, there's two different uh, paths to choose and one, one if we continue in that uh, greed uh, mentality of taking too much, then uh, then pandemics will happen and more uh, more things. So so it's it's um, yeah, it's something to think about too. I think. Mm -hmm. Are you both concerned for your communities? That. Um. Well, yes. Well, I mean, what is my community? Uh, my community is my family, a group of artists that I have, my peers. Um, I'm concerned for them, of course. Um, I'm concerned for my community of artists that I know through my profession. Uh, I'm concerned for. I mean, I, I, uh, my reserve community. I didn't grow up there. Uh, I was born in Fort Erie, Ontario, so I don't. Uh, refer to Six Nations of the Grand River Territories as as my community because I, I, I never live there. Of course, I'm concerned for for, for people there in the state. Uh, How is the situation the there? there? How is the situation there? Do you have some? Uh, um, it's 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 not it's not bad. It's 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 Ontario near Toronto, um, but. Uh, Conditions there are relatively good compared to how some reserves are in Canada. Um, so I think uh, that it's it's relatively in a in a good place. Um, you know, I have like everyone, I have elderly uh, relatives in 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 care and that's that's of course a concern but so far so good there as well um it's more i, th I think the effects are more uh, personally um being working from home for now four months i guess mm -hmm. or, since we arrived back from sydney in march 15th uh <clears throat> And those kinds of adjustments, I, I mean, I'm literally trying to go through, figure out medically what's, uh, what's happening with me because I'm uh, having difficulty breathing and, mm -hmm. and it's like, there's all these different theories right now as to why um, COVID's not one of them, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's a result of this, of whether it's ergonomics or asthma or this or that. There's there's something going on, um, and uh, and that's a thing. Uh, there, our work has shifted so much uh, to to having to figure out how to do it, re recalibrate. Do it, do everything, all, perform all of our functions. We're actually, I feel, we're twice as busy as we were before. Mm -hmm. 
in terms of dealing, you know, with it's it's more difficult to to do things. I spend a lot of my time uh, like this uh, in meetings um, every day, except for the weekends, um, and uh, and it's 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 uh, it's been amazing to see how much work we've been able to do and things that we are doing, but at the same time, there like everyone there's a, a huge shift in getting to this point um there's no real end in sight either our the national gallery is opening to the public on july 18th uh staff the only staff that are actually there are the ones that have to be there uh, the frontline staff uh, some conservators because we as curators can work fairly well from a home office, we're not required and even uh, uh, recommended to stay at home for the time being. Um, it's strange to be, I find it strange to be at home and not able to enjoy the things of being at home. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So it's, uh, so there's this confusing, I've always tried to <clears throat> very much divide uh, between my personal life and my and my work life, and now it's it's, it's of course very difficult to do that. Um, so it's it's so it's those kinds of things that are that uh, I'm thinking about now. Emily, you you as an artist, also as a working artist, who did this great work on creating system for your community. I know my, my colleagues, Peter Ackersall and Barry Furtman talked to you for their book, for the curating trauma churches and all that. What, what are you thinking about what, for, in your artwork and the essential questions, why we do art, what, what we have to focus on in these mm -hmm. months of uninterrupted often hours of thinking, is something changing? What, how, how deep do you go and can you share a bit? Mm -hmm. Well, I can speak of two things. First thing, which is having quite a big impact on me is uh, making a garden. Uh, this is my first uh, garden that I'm making. And I've been very, um, very inspired to think about my practice as I'm in the way that I garden. So really taking the time to uh, observe and give care to the seeds and the plants that's growing and thinking of that uh, reciprocity between the giving care to those plants and the, the, the giving that the plants will feed me or will uh, beautify the, the space. So I think there's something to, uh, and it's in align with the seasons and the, the natural rhythms. So I think there's a lot to learn about just watching things grow. And, and the, the thing is when COVID um, exploded, it was just the start of spring. So here the seasons are very um, marked in, uh, in, in Canada. So we really, when we came back, there was some snow and it was just, we made maple syrup. It was my first time making uh, maple syrup. And there was something very, um, very beautiful to just be able to watch nature change with rhythm and observe life being created because what we do is we create right and our our psyche and our imagination is is a dwell but we have to take care of that too so it's been um i guess by being more in that moment that slow that slowness was also very um informative of how I want to be now uh, with my art because I was traveling a lot and I was involved in a lot of projects. I'm still, I still have a lot to do now. My, my practice has more shifted to writing and uh, adapting uh, my work. I'm uh, collaborating with, um, with uh, some institutions here. They're called La Seine Nationale du Son to adapt uh, one of my play into a podcast series. So really thinking it's not a uh, theater for radio, but it's, um, it's fiction, fiction, uh, fiction for, for the ears. So how we can uh, 
then you know it's it's the play itself but then you can add um, interviews with uh, with different uh, knowledge keepers in align with the themes of the place so it's it's kind of interesting to uh, think of that and think more in terms of uh, storytelling for the ears so that's been uh, interesting and then the second and I have to create my upcoming uh, production, which is going to be uh, premiered in, um, in April in Montreal, if everything goes all right. And, um, and right now with everything that's been happening with uh, Black Lives Matter and, uh, and uh, the police brutality towards uh, indigenous and black communities, uh, it feels very, um, on point that I'm 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 working on the on the life of the first slave here in Canada in 1740. Her name was Marguerite Duplessis, and she was an indigenous woman. She was the first one to create a court case to ask for her to to have her freedom recognized because she was born here and she claims uh, that she had a French father and that she was baptized. Um, so there was a big trial. It was the first one here in, in Canada that took place. Um, and of course she lost because uh, the judge was a slave owner as if everybody um, in higher positions in Montreal at the time. And she was deported to uh, Martinique. And there is actually a big um, history of uh, indigenous slaves that were deported to the West Indies. Uh, for about 60 years from the end of the 1600s until, until the seven year war between France and England that was in 1760, I think, or around that time. Washington, so, George Washington. Pardon? Which George Washington started as a young, uh, young uh, uh, officer for the British army, yeah. But go on, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. No. So, um, so, and uh, so the, I'm writing for three actresses. It's a choral piece. Um, and it's really to link uh, the stories of uh, slavery between indigenous and uh, black African women that came to Martinique, but also to, uh, well, to, I don't know if celebrate is the word, but to give justice or importance to the to the stories of resistance of, uh, of black and indigenous slave women and how how that resistance has been transmitted through the generations to now and how is it embodied now so so yes yeah, so I'm writing I'm writing about that uh, right now this is my, my new project and there's a actually a really great book I have it right here he's um it's called Bonds of Alliance, and he's a scholar and historian. I think he teaches at the University of Ohio, Brett Rushforth, and this has been uh, my Bible so far. And he's really been researching about indigenous and Atlantic slaveries in New France. And uh, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, that, that's what I can say for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is uh, going really deep back in, into roots and history of Native Americans next to, to the devastating killings uh, by the white settlers, you know, also were enslaved in a part of that um, slave. And, uh, in the creation process too, to have to make sure that the team is as much as possible uh, indigenous and black within uh, all the designers and the actors and the dramaturge. So uh, I'm looking forward to being able to be in the same room again. Hopefully, mm. if everything uh, is going well, it will mm. be in uh, September, the first residency. And uh, yes, it will be uh, mm. very precious, I think, to be able to be in a, in a space together and start um, going deep into this, uh, this, this subject. Mm, into this. Yeah, we also talked to artists uh, from Martinique and maybe, you know, yeah, it's a good idea to collaborate. I mean, the story is so complex. As far as I know, also the Cherokee Nation owned slaves. Um, I think they had about four or 5,000 towards the end of the Civil War and also were landowners. And uh, so it's a very complicated issue 
um, um, all of it. But uh, Greg, how is it? How, how is it for you at that time of uh, isolation, next to work, also? But what what do you think about? What are your what are the existential questions? Emily also said that we are all asking us. Well, um, as I was mentioning earlier, just rethinking, you know, what does it mean to be a curator in these times? So uh, I think, and that that question, you know, is uh, also being tackled existentially. The the institution, the gallery, is trying to figure out what is its role. Um, during these times as a, you know, because uh, these are colonial institutions. Uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, matter <laughs> was an issue for the gallery because uh, uh, someone in communications, um, I guess kind of uh, in, in an effort to show alliance with the Black Lives Matter movement posted the Black Lives Matter logo on our Instagram account with uh, with no explanation, no, no context. And so it became a lightning rod for everything to question just what is the, the National Gallery of Canada's uh, intention and what are they doing to support Black lives? How, how do Black lives matter for the National Gallery of Canada? And when you take a, a, a close look at that, you see that black lives don't really matter. Um, not in the staff, not in the uh, amount of works that are uh, on view or in the collection, um, that uh, the only uh, black representation uh, at the gallery uh, is in security guards and cleaners uh the the staff is predominantly white and uh you know we've made some inroads in terms of indigenous representation and, and, and that's that's my role there and the department we actually have a department of indigenous art it's the exhibition that uh that i've uh, and my my uh, co-curators have put together is called abadakwane continuous fire Fou Continuelle uh, in French. And it's a show that uh, where uh, that expands the idea of, of indigenous and indigeneity. So it's a global uh, kind of survey of contemporary indigenous art. And in thinking globally in that, um, we so we have artists from uh, Central America, South America, Australia, New Zealand, um, the uh, uh, from Africa, from um, the Nordic countries, and of course Canada and the U.S. So, so in terms of skin color, um, there's you know all different colors, and and when we're when we're thinking about indigeneity in Africa. Uh, it becomes a very layered and complex question. Indigeneity is interpreted in different ways all over the world. Um, and it does and does not apply. It doesn't fit in Africa very well. It doesn't fit in uh, South America very well. Um, but it's still a question about uh, territory and where, of course, where people come from and how they represent themselves and how they're affected uh, uh, today through history of colonialism. So in the exhibition are a number of artists that deal with these issues and uh, and uh, I'm really happy that uh, the public's going to get another chance to see it um, until October. Uh, yeah, that, it is quite remarkable that the Black Lives Matter movement which, uh, according to research, is the largest civil rights movement ever in the history of the United States, just by sheer numbers of people growing up, so white people, but um, that they, which happened during COVID, you know, that one of the ramifications that's going around the world, that people really are rethinking their own 
relations, but also institutions, especially in Europe, uh, in Africa, everywhere we, we talk to, they're really um, um, a strong, strong connections. Um, Emily, we once had, I think, Don Dumont, a, a Canadian writer, she had to play fancy dancer and it dealt with the disappearance, I think, of Native American women. High, very high numbers. Um, yeah. Killing and, um, and talking about, you mentioned earlier, police brutality. How, how is that situation in, in, in Canada? Are you following that? Yes, well, we had it uh, now. I mean, I'm hoping that it's of um, public knowledge to every Canadian that this is uh, an epidemic, a serious epidemic in the country, because uh, there was a uh, um, an inquiry that uh, took place uh, in the last uh, three years, three years. And uh, the final report came out last June, uh, June in 2019, mm -hmm. uh, with many recommendations, but also stating very bluntly that what is happening uh, right now in regards to indigenous people is a genocide. And, uh, and um, our prime minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, or the Prime Minister of Canada said, well, he actually um, said, he recognized that it was. So, um, yeah. I mean, then there was many ministers uh, that have, uh, or people in power and journalists and a lot of on social media contesting and trying to minimize uh, that uh, it wasn't. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's important that uh, people start naming things as they are. And, uh, and uh, so it is, it is a very important issue. And I've been following a little bit in the States and seeing that uh, it's that there, well, I saw that in uh, Minnesota, there was an inquiry that was being uh, created into the missing and murdered indigenous women. So, yeah, I know that in the States, it is a very similar situation yeah. and that it needs to be uh, put into the light way more. Yeah. But it is, it, it is a very important issue here. Women and children and uh, uh, two-spirit and trans and, and people are the, peop are the, the most vulnerable um, to... Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm thinking in French, so sometimes the words don't, don't come to me right away, but uh, those are the most marginalized uh, communities. So um, it, uh, it manifests itself in, mm. the, in, in the death polls, basically, in the murders. Right at the moment of Black Lives Matter, there were two um, indigenous uh, persons that were killed in New Brunswick. That was um, last month. It was at the same time as uh, as uh, as the yeah as the the manifestations and all that. So there was a a woman in uh, Edmonston in New Brunswick uh, that was killed by a cop in her home. And, and uh, a few days later, there was a an indigenous man that was also killed by police. So, I mean, I think all of this is proving that it is important to, um, to link those uh, struggles together and to have solidarity between, uh, between Black and Indigenous groups. Mm. In, your, in your, your work of making art, do, do you feel something is shifting, is changing, like your upcoming productions or your work, will you... Will you um, Will there be an impact? I would say yes and no. I think yes in the sense that it is important to have hope and to be um, actively creating change. And I can see, for example, in my personal case that I have, um, I'm artist in residence at that uh, theater in Montreal. I'm also going to be the next uh, artist in residence at Espasco, which is another theater. And they give me, it's a residency for three years. So they give me um, the means to really uh, have my vision, to develop my vision. And those are really wonderful opportunities. And so far I've, Thea and I felt that I was free to bring in uh, the team that I wanted. So 
I think it's pretty um, amazing to have uh, indigenous bodies or people uh, at the theater. But then if you look at the figures, um, it's still, uh, it's still hardly any, especially here in Quebec, it's, it's uh, in Montreal, there's hardly any people of color, uh, playwrights or directors or people on stage a little bit more, but still it's such a minority. It doesn't represent the population here in, in, in Montreal or in Quebec. The people that you see on stage or the storytellers, that's, it's, it's, it's quite terrible to see that the numbers actually are not changing. So it feels mentalities or maybe it's our circles of people that are all artists or people that are um, thinking more in, in, in their politics or more is more aligned to mine. But um, when you look at the figure, there's a long way to go still. Mm. Yeah. Tell us a bit about the idea, if I say it right, ICS, what you created. Is that so as an artist, you in the idea of a Joseph Boyce who says, I have an enlarged understanding of all things we create as social sculptures or connections, or as Greg says, like the work you know of a curator is shifting us now to living beings or to create communities. What is what is the idea of your um of the, uh, it yeah. started because I I felt so. It was in 2016, and I I, I felt there was no um, festival or no, nothing or no um, platform for the presentation of uh, interdisciplinary work uh, by Indigenous artists. So it really stemmed from that that I felt we needed a, we needed a, a space, and then. Uh, uh, with ICS, I partner up with other institutions or festivals or venues to present uh, works. So we've uh, we've partnered up with, uh, you know, FTA, OFTA. Uh, right, last summer was with the Edinburgh International Festival, the Fringe, and the International Book Festival of Edinburgh. So we were able to present uh, the work of uh, several Indigenous artists. And the idea is to basically amplify the, the voices of these artists and but also especially internationally what what came about was uh, that there needs uh, more um, education about what's happening in Canada because a lot of people have this very um, positive idea of Canada mm -hmm. uh, abroad but when you do look at uh, Indigenous issues and people, we it's it's not such a glossy picture anymore. So it's it's important to to educate people too, and so to have that international solidarity. Mm -hmm. Are you an agent uh, in a way? You 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 it's agent? An agent. you connect artists uh, or so people say. I would like to include artists, and you make suggestions and. Uh, Oh, well, I mean, I think I'm more like an artistic director or a, a curator in that sense. So I, I, I create a, pro, uh, a program. Um, I, uh, I like to work with themes as well. So then I kind of uh, choose the works or the artist um, in regards to, to the theme that we want to tackle. Um, it's hard work. <laughs> it's hard work. Um, and it's not always easy to reconcile being an artist and uh, a producer or a curator. Mm -hmm. So, and I think after Edinburgh now, I want to, uh, I'm taking a break and focusing on my art for, for, for now. So the next one won't be happening before 2022. Mm -hmm. You, you create a platform for artists. So in a sense, you're, you're promoting artists. You're not, you're not, you don't represent artists as an agent. Um, no. uh, more and more, um, Emily and I are trying to find ways to work together as well. Um, so as a, as an artist team, as, um, so I have, I have a, a practice as an artist as well um so i was able Emily invited me to participate in the in the fringe festival in, in edinburgh and 
and I went there. Uh, came to mind because you you mentioned how people uh, the view of Canada is, is generally not known, right? And and even that their uh, state of Indigenous peoples in Canada and Canada's history and this part of my project is kind of tackling uh, a little piece of that um and what is you know what's the name what's the origin of the word canada where does it come from it comes from uh mohawk word ganada and uh that means town or village that was recorded by jacques Cartier in 1535 and transmuted to canada um and you know and in that process is land disp dispossession and identity dispossession and a kind of a total erasure of history um, of indigenous peoples in Canada. So this project is a way of putting that back. Um, so it's a project to redesign the national symbols of Canada, uh, replace the name Canada with Ganada, uh, change the flag so that it represents indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis and Inuit with three feathers and the, where the maple leaf would be in the flag. And then to just kind of uh, surreptitiously insert it in different places uh, uh, through the years. So this was an opportunity to create uh, a space within the Canada hub that was part of the Edinburgh Festival and uh, and create Ganada Club and uh, and to communicate all those ideas. So there was it was an interesting uh, opportunity. So you know, kind of explaining that as really a lot of what you do and having been one of those artists that benefited from the platform that you created, uh, which does uh, a lot of work the Indigenous contemporary scene. And you've, but we, uh, you've done so it what in we, different places. Yeah. We we changed the word Canada everywhere to Ganada. So people, it was a way for people to start thinking about the indigenous origins of and the indigenous, yeah, the indigenous origin of the word and and uh, the indigenous presence in this territory that we now call Canada. Mm. Yeah, it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic project. And I think it's a, an important uh, idea to define uh, uh, the work and as an artist also part of, become a curator, you know, to also uh, think in structures and be part of, um, of a change. Um, what guides you in, in, in your, what do you look for when you, when you say, I uh, put together these artists in that context under that theme? What is your, what are your, well, I guess it de it it depends. Uh, you know, if I'm working uh, with, I mean, that's why I call it a platform instead of a festival. Because sometimes mm -hmm. one year we organize the creators exchange, um, so those are important spaces for us to gather among us and to have discussions, but also to engage. Um, Cre artistically together or creatively. So uh, we had invited, uh, when we did that, we had invited, um, and the theme was around self-representation and representation. So we had invited uh, a Maori uh, choreographer based in Sydney, her name is Victoria Hunt. And she led a workshop based on a performance that she did about uh, the human remains of her ancestor being in a museum in London. And so, and so, yeah, so it was, you know, it was taking that theme and then guiding us as a group um, to, to think about these questions, but also uh, it was during FTA, so we were able to go see a lot of works that come from, from many places in the world and uh, organize um, artists, or talkbacks for conversations with the creators themselves, so to, to, I mean, it, to just foster more um, conversations, I guess, on form, on, uh, on art, and see how then that, 
that regenerates us and that um, inspire us. In Edinburgh, just before um, the festival happened, we also did a creator's exchange on the land because it was also important to connect to the land. And, um, and from my many travels over there, I feel that Scottish people, especially Gaelic people, feel very um, close to, uh, or there's a lot of resonance for them with what is happening in Canada in terms of uh, land theft, uh, boarding schools, having those, the language taken away from them. But uh, here in Canada, it was Johnny McDonald who was born in Glasgow, who was the prime minister of Canada and who created, uh, you know, residential schools and, uh, and um, so then there was this conversation about um, when you've been oppressed, um, do, you, do you become an oppressor or this, this kind of um, many layers uh, that, that, that exist in, in, in these conversations. And a lot of indigenous uh, people here in Canada have ancestry that are Scottish. So they have ancestors in Scotland as well. So to, to be able to address all these questions and the programming was kind of articulated around these questions as well. Mm. What, can, what can we learn? I mean, we also have listeners from around the world. I think it's Europe or Africa and uh, Asia. Um, from the practices of indigenous artists, going back to tradition, but also contemporary ones. We, we are in a different situation at the moment. We have to reinvent forms, we have to adapt. But what experiences do you have? Or do you think is something that people should think about or know about? What is something we could, uh, should take into consideration? I, I think um, one of the, distinguishing features of, of a lot of uh, work by contemporary Indigenous artists is uh, from non-Indigenous artists is the connection to to culture um, to uh, and bringing traditions forward traditions evolve and change over time um, and but what comes through in a lot of the work is is how connected and how relevant um, these knowledges are to contemporary lives and to, and to even to, to conceive of ourselves in the future. Um, that, and in those knowledges and in that connection is uh, the intrinsically, the relationship between human beings with the rest of the planet with the rest of the environment. So what are what are what is our position in relation to our relatives that who are not just people but the earth, the land, the skies, the waters, the animals, the plants, um, the spirit beings, all of that. And and that concept is very much alive and very much held and and treasured. And if you're thinking that way, you're existing uh, in the space in, in the world in a very different way. And you can manifest that thinking in those relationships in how you organize your life, how you choose to do things. Uh, like as Emily's talking about uh, becoming more aware, slowing down and becoming more aware of uh, the seasons and the changing and the plant cycles through physically uh, digging in the ground and planting things and watching them grow. These are, these are things that in uh, our capitalist culture, we've removed ourselves from, we've distanced ourselves from food production uh, and, and created these large factory farms, you know, and, and COVID is coming out of that. Um, how we treat animals now in, in food production. Uh, so, so it is, it, it, these things are connected and, and it's causing us to, uh, to rethink in so many ways. And when I think of artists, I think artists are very 
and, and I, when I say artists, I mean theater artists, all, all kinds of artists are uniquely placed to comment on these things, to remind us um, that there are different ways of being in the world and to, uh, and to give direction and to ask questions and to challenge us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. I I think those are there. <laughs> to end, yeah. to end, actually. What comes to your mind, Emily, when you say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm serious about it because I feel we, we are a bit, you know, lost uh, in the way where things went. Everybody says that it's you now came to a halt. Um, we, we are realizing perhaps more than you have been uh, knowing uh, since uh, since centuries that yeah that critical zone the 10 meters above us the 10 meter below us that we live we are alive because of plants you know because it's alive we had Frédéric uh, who works with Bruno Latour and he said you know be realizing that we are not at the center of the universe like Galileo um, found out that earth is not the center of the universe actually we are part of the universe and we are floating around that uh, that um, right now humans have to understand that we are part of nature, that we are part of that, that we live through others and we don't respect it, if we don't understand it, it will um, de de destroy us. So I think uh, um, um, indigenous artists and spider women too said that, you know, so they, they said, I talk to the trees, I put my hand in the dirt, um, yeah. I connect to the living things and I appreciate them. And it, if there is the big threat, it is an environmental threat, if there's any great theme right now, perhaps it is the environment, everything Trump does, hopefully can and will be returned, but the environmental damage, uh, how will that be uh, changed? And we are, uh, we need to be aware. So I think, uh, I really would like to hear you, what you feel in your theater work or performance work, where you felt this is something that worked to communicate that or, or the, way you did it, is there something, or other artists you know about, where you feel this is something that should be considered, the way we produce it, the way we show it, we showed it? Well, I think like what Greg said, you know, everything is interconnected, interrelated. So it is, uh, it is important to uh, work towards healing our connection to the land and uh, being able for that, I think a lot of it is, is listening or deep listening and being able to to hear the land or hear the plants or hear and, and feel that connection. I think there's a lot in that. And that's really where I want to take my, my practice now and or really think more deep deeply about that. And and uh, I'm sure it's gonna it's gonna be beneficial in in what I want, in how I want to create and what I want to say, like f for sure the stories and the, what we will want to say and share with the world will be, um, will be, will be influenced by what we're going through right now. It, it doesn't mean that we're going to write about pandemics or the environment, but this experience that we all have collectively will, 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 will have a profound impact i think on 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 us and i'm i'm hoping i'm actually because sometimes i'm i'm afraid that we'll just fall back in the train of how it was and it's it's uh this is the worry but if we're wise enough to seize this opportunity to really reflect in a deep way and and and, and try to to apply these changes in, in, in the way we live and the way we create and the way we write and the way we love and the way we, 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 we take care of community, I think, I think it will be uh, inspiring. And, and if I go back to this um, new work that I'm uh, working on about uh, Marguerite Duplessis, mm -hmm. um, so part of my research so her trial was very well documented i have her, her trial but when she lost the trial then we know nothing we know she was deported to martinique and when i traveled there i was trying to find where where did she go uh, you know in the archives i couldn't find anything i, I found some information about the the man that owned her and sold her to uh, a plantation in martinique but um 
So then a lot of the work was about finding that memory, but in the invisible. So about really tuning in and feeling, you know, feeling, well, would she have been in this place? And the work is, is to honor her life. She was the first activist, indigenous activist in Canada, when I think of it, because she was the first one to have a trial and uh, seek justice at that level. So her life is important, her legacy is important, and it is all there. My, my, my work is just to try and make it visible, accessible. And what I wanna do or how I'm, I'm thinking about this work is to create um, an honor song for her or um, because her human remains are in this part of the world that is very far from her ancestors and her, her people. So I want to um, sing her back home in a way. And the work is very much informed by that. And the um, um, actors that I, there are three women, one of them is from Martinique and two other are indigenous from here. So the, a lot of the work is to, to sing for, for our, these women that are heroes and that, that have to be brought back to the surface, to our ancestors, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's a significant and important uh, uh, um, contribution. I remember a spider woman, I was in Gloria or Maria said, you know, because we are sick because we don't tell the story, carry them in us in a file sort of way. And the society is sick because they don't hear the stories, you know, they're, and contribution you make, of course, is uh, towards healing and towards honoring and singing the song and acknowledging that, and as you both say, the representation of indigenous people, people of all color is important and, uh, in the United States, but also as you both point out in Canada, where we all think you know, it's more free spirited, but in this theater scene, at least what also friends and colleagues say, it is not as uh, prominent as one thinks, even in TV and TV commercials, it's a much bigger variety. You see the people on the street, on the screen, but in theater itself, still it has uh, some way to go and your work um, is an important um, um, contribution towards that visibility. And I think now also as a moment that perhaps created an opening and an irritation, a shock, which we go through in the Western world, where our colleagues from Africa, or Arab world say, we live like this, you know, for decades or centuries with uncertainty, with malaria, with wars. It's just you guys who, you know, all of a sudden understand that there's something you don't know. and We don't know how it's going to end and to live that you can die from a handshake, basically. And, uh, or from the wrong word you post or wrote somewhere in, so it's uh, it's it is an, uh, a quite quite a, um, a remarkable time we live in and and really thank you both uh, for sharing and I'm here yeah, I'm he hearing back you know what you said about the smallpox which as far as I know also intentionally was transmitted by the army through blankets or others where they knew that there was no protection against uh, smallpox no vaccinations and as you said 80 90 percent of population died from that. It's a shocking to really think about this. And uh, and as Black Lives Matter so rightly says, this is the original sin of America, uh, the slavery, but then there is also the, the sin, the curse under the curse, which is, you know, the taking away of indigenous lands in a, in a fashion that was a, a colonial imperial uh, mindset, and it uh, still hasn't uh, shined through it's almost like someone said the Oedipus myth where you know that he kills his father and sleeps with the mother and he is cursed but then the underlying curse was that his father mistreated the crayon as a young king um, a young uh, a guest he had a son of a friend and then he was cursed and says your son will kill you so the underlying curses and I think what you bring out there and show um, is, a, is significant and we all also in New York City and in Nappy land you know, it was not mentioned, it is not uh, uh, acknowledged as often as in Australia often, you know, in, uh, in public ceremonies, it's very clearly stated. I don't know exactly how it is in Canada, but um, there's a lot of work we have to do. And this is a moment where we can really think about it. So thank you both for really, really for taking the time and it could go on much longer. And I hope I was able to um, 
ask the right questions, you know, to get, get a little insight. And it's, uh, of course, so complex and it goes so deep. And perhaps we also need other forms and just uh, simple um, conversations. But I felt really that um, we got a little, little insight. As we come closer now to, to the end, we're a bit over time, what, what, uh, what is your advice you would give uh, to young artists, uh, whether they're indigenous or not, and to, to our listeners, how to use this time best based on your experience? What, what, should, what should we do to find meaning or to, or to create meaning? And how can we use this, this complicated time? Greg, if you were first, Emily. <laughs> I want you to go first. I would just say, just make art. Just, just, yeah. just do things. Just uh, be inspired. If you're a filmmaker, have a camera. If you're buy paints, uh, start drawing. Write. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's just, just do it. Just do it. Mm -hmm. To continue your practice. I think. Uh, I mean, it, to try to look at at it in a positive way that maybe this is a time if if you're an artist and you're able uh, you have the physical space uh, even the mental space to to create to, to think about your practice to to do it but I think you know singularly it's a time to think about what, what we've been talking about too the those existential questions what it why why does my art matter what what do i matter as a human being in relation to the to the rest of the world and how can i improve that relationship and honor those relationships um yeah yeah and i think it's also it's okay if you're not creating if you're not making art it's also totally fine creation is happening all the time if we look at it so maybe it is also a time to just be a sponge and 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 go through things and eventually that will manifest in in some creation after so i think it's also okay not to do anything mm. yeah and as you said earlier to observe right to see that's what we can do we have our bodies and we can observe and be be in the moment. So really, uh, really, really thank you for um, um, giving us a, a, an insight and sharing your your experience. I hope one day you both will come to the Siegel Center when we are open and running again and um, come with uh, Emmanuel Serra and others and, uh, and with the Quebecois delegation here uh, in New York. And we all uh, intensify this. And it's good to know that, you know, independent from the theater performance scene, of course, you know, that, as Greg pointed out, there have been long-standing uh, connections between the individual arts and, uh, and in filmmaking between those two countries. But oh, somehow I always feel um, in the performing art world, it should be much closer and it's not. And I'm always baffled by that and I don't fully understand it. We continue our journey around the world. Tomorrow we will have uh, Satoke Ishihara, a young, uh, I think very significant a Japanese uh, writer, experimental writer, was pushing for the post post feminist, uh, post punk, uh, I would almost say, uh, uh, crafter of words. And I'm interested to hear what she is going through uh, in Japan that is also experiencing a second wave now at the moment and how the situation is for artists. Thursday, Nigel Smith from the Flea Theater here. Uh, in New York will tell us how uh, his experiences with COVID. He took over um, the, the flea from Jim Simpson and, um, and he's a young black, uh, 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 what would one say now, curator, artistic director, and now he's in the presenting organizations, representing a theater and he, which he inherited and uh, his community and, uh, and of course in this, uh, this heated times of Corona. So we will hear how he is trying to keep this all together. And then Jean Glaude van Italy, a most significant writer who did the great Vietnam play, I think in the 60s, America Hurrah, La Mama, and uh, uh, is Belgian born and uh, refugee who came here and now has a big uh, a farm upstate, Chantigar, uh, or, an est or a retreat where he uh, feels we have to connect to the land as you both also said, we have to listen to it, we have to 
meditate and we have to create new practices in the arts that encompass uh, beyond um, the simple uh, performing or the machine or the industry as uh, Emily said in the beginning that it is really a time to think and I think maybe he has found some answers he's done that now for some decades so really thank you both of you thanks for HowlRound for hosting us it's fantastic to be here with you out of Emerson College so we have that platform as Emily would say you know that also connects us all closer and um, Travis and uh, VJ and uh, Thea who is with us every morning and Sun Young and Andy, my Siegel team, and to your listeners for taking again time out of your life and of your time to listen to ours. I think it is very significant to listen uh, to our, uh, for example, Canadian indigenous uh, artists or fellows, what it's on their mind. Uh, so it's a check with reality and knock at the door and say, how are you doing? How, what is the state? And as both of them pointed out, what we think about Canada or in this case, is might not be this, what it really is about. There's so many things in our lives that we do see it wrongly or we don't know enough. And this uh, series, this little series is a contribution um, towards that. And it's important to have listeners to also then perhaps think uh, and take the ideas of, of what Emily said, you know, maybe connect to the earth, listen closely, observe, or as uh, Craig said, you know, support the community, support your colleagues, your elders, how to get can be transferred to your own life and it might really save our life and our country if we listen closely to what artists say. Artists are part and have always been part of progressive justice. They were always on the right side in the complex struggle and fight for liberties and freedom. And they are again now, and we uh, have as the myth or the prophecies, as you mentioned, Oli, we have to decide as societies and countries and humans, where do we want to go for ourselves, but also for our societies and these are important and significant decisions and we should listen to artists and their solutions and suggestions so thank you both and i hope to uh, see and hear you all again and thanks for tuning in so stay tuned wear a mask it is important and, and thank you